wonderful lecture. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted uh, to get the title of one of the books that you mentioned right before you mentioned Harrington, the Other America. Mm -hmm. And then also um, the title of uh, Giuliani's book that you Giovanni. mentioned. Giovanni, Towards the End. Yes, Discourses of Denial. Okay. published by UBC Press, uh, 2006. Um, the one, the other one, I'm not quite sure, maybe you should uh, have a word afterwards. It, it yeah, <laughs> reminds me of a um, story I was once told by about uh, Monsignor Ronald Knox, who was a very prominent Catholic uh, public intellectual in Britain uh, some decades back, who was apparently a very brilliant student and he had not been behaving as he should as a student and doing his essay, and so he turned up for the philosophy thing with his tutor, just him and the tutor, and uh, he read an essay, supposedly, with his pages like this. There was nothing on the pages, right? He just <laughs> turned a page from time to time and continued to talk. <laughs> and it all went fine until his professor at the end said, well, that was very interesting, Mr. Knox, thank you very much. Could you just go back to the point you made on page four? <laughs> <laughs> and so, I can't quite remember, but if okay. you come to me afterwards, maybe well, I'll find the Kennedy quote and we can work from there. Okay, and um, I was also going to ask, um, there are lots of other sources about gender and media, um, but I just wanted to um, know if you uh, came back from Victoria last weekend and uh, noticed a headline that uh, the uh, real estate agents uh, were considered uh, fearful for act asking to have a um, response system through their cell phones um, because several of them had been attacked and now this 22 year old woman um, had been murdered uh, while she was showing a home. Um, and uh, she had uh, notified two of her other co-workers that she was fearful or concerned about this person that she was showing this home to. And I was wondering about the word fearful, because in that situation, um, they are making it seem like uh, these women were unnecessarily fearful about um, showing people these homes, even after several of them had been attacked and this woman had been murdered. Um, and in other cases, I would think that the word would be um, outraged or challenged or something like that. Do you think that uh, in uh, this hemisphere, but in a lot of media, uh, women are portrayed as being uh, fearful or victimized or other things like that? I think that, yes, I mean, I think there's certainly a very <coughs> long tradition, uh, entrenched tradition of, of seeing women as um, not challenging as passive and so on, and that's uh, obviously uh, sort of a very deep cultural kind of stereotype. Um, it's difficult for me to comment on that particular case because I only arrived in Canada yesterday evening and I wasn't actually aware of it. But at the same time, if that's much on people's minds at the moment and other people would like to discuss it now, I mean, that's fine by me. But um, so please, I, I want to. I don't want to close off that uh, issue if it's on people's minds, but I'm not sure that uh, I have anything much useful to say about the specifics uh, beyond my response to the, the general say, statement about yes, by and large, and that women who uh, women who are um, who do sort of express pugnacity, if you like, uh, in response to issues are very often defined as behaving inappropriately, but. Those are generalities. Well, you mentioned in passing roots as a, a production, a media production in the United States that was anti racist. But it seems to me, remembering different things, that actually there's some of the finest uh, media work that's been done in the United States is anti racist. And that actually, even though there's quite a racist climate, uh, there seems to have been quite an industry, and we just saw Raiden in the Sun be played here recently, but I mean, from there forward, many different media products. Do you think that these 
It's a two-part question. One, do you think that these are actually having an effect on the consciousness of the public in the United States? But also, is there anything comparable in other parts of the world? Within the limits of an already very long lecture, I couldn't kind of give uh, a huge number of examples. But I was trying to stress at the end the extent to which, I mean, up and down the hemisphere, there were people who, who challenged these issues, the media makers of various kinds who challenged these issues. And I tend to think that uh, <coughs> quite often the most, um, some of the most important people, people I spent, as I say, no time at all talking about in the body of the lecture, uh, are musicians and singers um, who very often challenge these and have a lot of uh, play. Uh, sometimes the fact they're underground um, and don't get much commercial play makes them all the more prized by activist sectors of the public um, <clears throat> and all the more inspirational to them. So, yeah, I think there's a lot. In terms of Roots itself, it's a complicated deal because uh, a very complicated, and I'm not going to be able to handle what I see as all the complications. On the one hand, the fact that it graphically and over a single week or so, or a series of consecutive days, represented a feature of uh, US history, which by and large until that time hardly got dealt with at all in the schools and so on, <clears throat> did so with the power of television and the power of a dramatic narrative and the identification with characters. Um, on that level, very powerful. On another level, you could argue that a dimension of the story is, in a sense, um, the, um, the author of the original uh, book and, and the series, Alex Haley, uh, it ends up by being Haley's family. And so it ends up by being a series of individuals who faced much more than the average set of obstacles faced by immigrant white Americans but uh, nonetheless got there in the end. And so on some level, Roots could be read as a demonstration that yes, African Americans have had a far tougher time than everybody else, but they're now kind of there. It is possible, at least, to be there. I, Alex Haley, got there. Now, um, you know, that may be a dyspeptic reading, but, um, <laughs> but uh, there are various dimensions to Roots, I think, and uh, a proper discussion would, would take longer than, than that, but those are my thoughts. In the last uh, few months, uh, observing uh, the U.S. Uh, presidential uh, campaign, I've been puzzled by how the media uh, in general has dealt with uh, the situation of Barack Obama. He seems to be presented as a post-racist Politician, uh, and uh, once that's uh, uh, used, the whole question of anti-black racism has been washed away. You know, he, uh, a man who is just above it all, he transcends the question, and the uh, the whole kerfuffle about right. Uh, I, I I don't think that right. Uh, has said anything that Martin Luther King uh, didn't say, or that uh, Malcolm X, I think Malcolm X, was even stronger in his connotation. Can you talk about this phenomenon? It puzzles me. There are a lot of things going on, and I don't know that I can tap into all of them, um, even in my own imagination. But one of the things that seems to be going on in the present campaign and the media treatment of Obama is that there's a kind of certain history of a kind of African-American politician represented to some degree by Jesse Jackson or the Reverend Al Sharpton, some others, which is of somebody <coughs> who kind of uh, rasps and orates and denounces and yells and um, uh, is also very self-publicizing. Um, against that, there are career politicians or military people, I think particularly somebody like Colin Powell, uh, who some years back, I forget exactly when, but there were polls being undertaken, uh, might have been about eight or nine years ago, which suggested that uh, potentially a large number of Americans of all colors and so on would like to see him run for president, and if he did, would vote for him. 
And so you have a certain contrast between figures considerably in the public eye who are black, uh, who are in the Sharpton, Jesse Jackson mode of address, and then you have this other wing of politicians, of public figures, uh, who are not. Now, if you put that together with the fact that um, the American public, having voted by a three million majority or so in, uh, in 2004 to put uh, George W. Bush back into office, and then have realized increasingly the, the idiocy of their decision. Um, it means that at the moment you look around and in a sense what have you got? You've got, as the dust has settled, you've got an elderly and um, much more right-wing politician uh, than maybe some people realize. Um, <clears throat> You've got um, somebody from the Clinton era who is basically part of a certain kind of machine-like definition of, of the technology of politics. Um, and you have this person who uh, has no negative embarrassments, right? And seems, therefore, to be plausible, and certainly speaks very well, and so far um, has not put any major foot wrong. And hence, the determined effort by the variety of people who, for a variety of reasons, don't want to see him get the nomination, um, then at that point, the Reverend Jeremiah Wright excerpt, um, and anything which suggests that there are two Obamas, which is one of Rush Limbaugh's favorite arguments at the moment, there are two Obamas, there's a nice Obama and a real Obama, um, that kind of argument then becomes uh, more and more important for people who wish to discredit his candidacy. Now, whether they'll be successful or not is obviously yet to be seen. But I think to some degree the, the, uh, the role of the media in this is explained in part by the factors I've talked about and in part by the fact that uh, journalists do very often, not all, but very often operate in packs they operate accepting each other's definitions of reality. Um, they're not all hardworking, penetrating folk. Um, some are, absolutely, but they're not all. And therefore, it's very easy for certain forms of consensus to emerge for a while until something happens. And then suddenly a new form, a new consensus can emerge. Now, if the Jeremiah Wright um, scenario has to be, uh, sort of ends up by having sufficient wind pumped into it, then that will become the, wasn't it a pity, uh, he looked so promising, but then of course as we thought about it, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't to be. Um, as regards Obama himself, I just want to throw in one other, one other comment. I see him as having been in a position where um, he could not usefully refer to the whole text of the Jeremiah Wright sermon. Because he knew, obviously, that the vast majority of voters would never bother to read it. They wouldn't kind of hunt it down and read it. The sermon was what the TV news operations had made it in that sort of mini few second loop which went over and over and over again for two weeks. That was the speech by the time Obama came to make his speech in Philadelphia. And it was impossible, I would suggest, for him to reply to the speech as a whole in, in, his, in his own comment. And therefore, all he could do was try to move the debate to a point where the issue was no longer being simplified, but the complexities of the issues and the real issues and the way this could act as a distraction from them could be given some attention. We'll see if he's successful or not. Uh, I hope you wouldn't uh, find my question slightly off topic because it extends beyond racism and it kind of includes secularism as well. Uh, I'm interested in, in learning about your thoughts and your observations in the last six years or so and I'm referring to what happened in September 2001. 
whether you have seen a shift of racism uh, with respect to certain communities, because I've read, I've heard on TV that African Americans are not the blacks anymore, a Muslim is the new black mm -hmm. in USA. Uh, I'm wondering about your thoughts on that, and whether you see the, the, the Islamophobic culture that mainstream media has now created, uh, whether that's also part of this, this entire racist culture, or whether, or whether this is something new or, uh, or a new phenomenon that you have never seen before, uh, and how does that tie into secularism? Islamophobia I mean, goes back, obviously, at least to, to the Christian Crusades. Um, and has been a staple dimension of European cultures uh, for you know, many, many centuries. And what I tend to think happens is that many of these issues, stereotypes, concepts, discourses can lie dormant or semi-dormant for quite a while. And then, under the pressure of events, and those events can include highly unscrupulous political leaders, um, they can be summoned back into life. Uh, sometimes surprisingly quickly and with surprising kind of uh, venom um, attached. Um, in terms of um, the question of, you know, that Muslims are the new uh, black people, um, I think that on a certain level of operation, there's an element of truth in that. It's certainly the case, I mean, I have, for instance, a, um, one uh, doctoral student from Bangladesh who recently completed his dissertation, and he found in his research in New York's Bangladeshi community um, that Bangladeshis who'd lived in the United States uh, for you know, 10, 20, 25 years found the situation after 9-11 totally different. And it was something which kind of shocked them because apart from a, a very general identification with uh, fellow Muslims who are Arab, uh, they never thought of themselves as Arabs and they couldn't understand why, as Bangladeshis, they were being identified as being part and parcel of the Arab world. Not that that makes any sense anyway, because as we know, there were masses of different opinions in the Arab world. So, um, so I think the intensification on the media level, on the daily level, the interpersonal level, and so on, all these levels has been very tangible. Um, and so that certainly has changed. I think, um, however, that the, the notion that somehow the experiences and the processes which govern black people's lives in the United States have suddenly kind of uh, switched gear, um, I think, I'm sure, I am certain that you know, if you apply for a mortgage, if you apply for a job, if you apply for all kinds of things in the United States, medical care, whatever, you know, all the evidence is there, repeated surveys over decades and decades now. And I don't think that all those daily practices have suddenly kind of people said, oh no, we shouldn't do that anymore because now we should only think about being nasty to or discriminating against uh, people who are Muslims. Um, our capacity as humans to have multiple targets for being nasty to is really a matter of historical record. In, in about whiteness, to me what comes to mind is there's a dominant clique that wants to maintain its status, mm -hmm. and so it excludes everyone who doesn't fit its parameters. And uh, are there a few aspects of that ideology that are capable of being specified and critiqued so as to subvert it? Well, I think, um, I mean, it's got more complicated, obviously, over the last sort of couple of two or three decades, because you know, when you have the Reagan cabinet and the Bush, two Bush uh, cabinets, including people of color in the cabinet, you know, you say that, at least on the political level, in terms of the political class, there clearly is not an absolute refusal, right? Whereas, uh, you know, it's until the election of Lula in Brazil, uh, it had previously been impossible to find an Afro-Brazilian in the cabinet. Um, I'm not sure when, I believe, sometime during the 1990s, the uh, Cuban uh, Politburo uh, may have admitted an Afro-Cuban, but for the first 40 years, there was no Afro-Cuban in the Politburo in Cuba. 
So I mean, this is this is a very deep seated, deep rooted issue. So it's. It can certainly be attacked. I mean, there are Afro-Cubans who have, in a variety of ways, I never sort of got to Cuba, but there are Afro-Cubans who, in a variety of ways, have sought to subvert this, uh, not always in ways which I can particularly join in with, but they have. So it doesn't go without challenge. But I just think that the process of challenge, as I say, this has been laid down over 500 years, and the process of challenge includes exposing and critiquing the idea, but it also means living out that critique in all kinds of practical way and a, a degree of patient resolve over decades and, and more than decades in, in gradually pushing it down. Not that it wouldn't be great to push it away instantly, but I don't think that something that has been put in place over 500 years can be rolled up like a rug, whatever the energy. I've just been subjected to about two weeks of American media, just returned to um, this alternative universe. And um, I have the sense that across the spectrum, the, the American media, and I suppose you know, pundits in general, are celebrating the candidacies of um, Obama and, and Clinton as a historic breakthrough uh, relative of uh, race and gender, uh, respectively. And um, I'm, I'm a little more cynical myself, I guess. I'm just wondering, do you think would it make any real difference in terms of either American public policy or political culture uh, if either of them were elected? Okay. Well, my, my, personal, my, my personal view is, is as follows, and I've got into trouble with this uh, two or three months ago with very dear African-American friends up in Chicago when I voiced this. My personal view is that um, Obama is sincerely, honestly, uh, a centrist. Um, they felt that I was outrageously kind of neglecting uh, the progressive positions which he was undertaking. So let me explain myself. What I mean by this is that the basic um, geography, if you like, of the American political spectrum, the political culture, is so far to the right that a centrist can seem like a frothing leftist. But I think he is sincerely and honestly. I think that's exactly where he is politically, right? And I also think that the primary influences on American politics are not out of Washington. They're in Wall Street and boardrooms around the country and in Las Vegas and, and Hollywood and so on and so on. And in Seattle and, you know, uh, all the major industri industrial sectors. So um, that means, therefore, that the best that one can hope for in the United States is somebody who is a centrist, because anybody who's left of that will never get elected at this point in history. And so if you have any belief in the political process at all as it's constructed in the United States, then you have to hope that maybe this time a centrist can be elected rather than somebody who was born again and speaks to God. Um, can I just say, because I forgot to at the moment, so embarrassed at the revelation of my beer drinking habits, um, <laughs> a, a thank you for the very kind remarks from Professor Zhao and Professor Haggart introducing me. Thank you. Okay.